You're listening to Threads Radio. My name's Luke Fraser, and this is The Tonic.
Well, I don't always go in for concertos, but that's just great in my opinion. Two movements there from Anna Klein's 2019 cello concerto in all but name. It's actually called Dance and the movements, the first one, When You're Broken Open and the fourth, In Your Blood. She's a London born and Grammy nominated composer, now resident in the US, who works in both instrumental and electroacoustic music. And Dance, in capital letters, is titled after the poem by the 13th century Persian writer and mystic Rumi, with each of the five lines of that short poem forming the name of one of the movements. So we get Dance when you're broken open, Dance if you've torn the bandage off, Dance in the middle of the fighting, Dance in your blood, and Dance when you're perfectly free. To me, it's just a beautifully crafted, unpretentious and emotionally direct piece without ever being manipulative. And bearing in mind the use of the cello throughout and its strong tonal, wide angled and almost filmic nature, it never becomes too gushing or maudlin. It's also very seamless in how it integrates its stylistic sources. Filmic as mentioned, but also often folk-like, though I don't know the actual sources if there are particular ones and with Baroque echoes in that fourth as well. And it's probably just me, but I can't help hearing in the brass and strings riff in the middle of that fourth movement, an echo of Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue, of all things. It's performed with a real sense of poise there by both Inbal Segev on cello and the London Philharmonic Orchestra under the baton of Marin Allsop. And it's taken from the album Anna Klein Dances, Edward Elgar Cello Concerto, and was released on Abbey earlier this year. No. 
yet another incredible testament to the seemingly infinite expressiveness of the human voice. That's Karen Renkvist's breakthrough work, David's Nim, written in 1984. We've all become accustomed to brilliantly inventive uses of the voice, hailing from all corners of the world, whether that be alpine yodeling, Inuit throat singing, conical or the scat singing of Indian classical music, and so on and so forth. But I at least had never heard sounds quite like those at the start of that piece. They're derived from kulning, traditional Nordic herding calls dating back to at least medieval times, and which are used to coax livestock down from high mountain pastures. As you can guess, the sound needs to travel long distances, and there's also speculation that they may also be used to ward off predators such as wolves and bears. And what is fascinating for me is the duality of its utilitarian function on the one hand, with its unmistakable aesthetic qualities on the other, suggesting, well, loneliness, sadness, mourning even, but also harshness, rawness, something almost primeval and brutal. And as we listen to that piece, we're immediately cast into a strange and primal landscape and whilst there is a certain reassurance of familiarity that starts to accrue in the first few minutes, I love the way the piece then moves towards a climax shortly before the end that is just incredibly disconcerting and strange. And I found myself doing a double take, because whilst on the one hand the musical elements have not really changed since the start, it's as though those elements have been picked up, thrown headlong, and dashed against some ancient desolate rock far below. And Karen Rehnquist is known as a composer who specializes in vocal and choral music. She said that singing is where I belong and my voice is my instrument. And she works in that, for me, fascinating hinterland between so-called folk music and so-called art music. And it's that creation of these new hybrids that seem like worlds unto themselves that is surely one of the great achievements that any artist can make. That piece, as mentioned, went a fair way towards establishing her name and was written specifically with the vocalists Lena Vilmark, Suzanne Rosenberg and Agnetha Christensen in mind. It's taken from the album of the same name, David's Nim, and that was released on Phono Swekia in 1996.
loving that. Such a subtle and elegant combination of Persian and European elements. That's two of the Persian folk songs by Reza Valley, an Iranian composer born in Gazvin and now living in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, I believe. The first one was Longing and the second In Memory of a Lost Beloved. The Persian folk songs are an ongoing cycle that he's been adding to since 1978, with some based on folk melodies and some composed in the style of them. They were written for Iranian cellist Kian Sultani, who performs them there along with a pianist, Aaron Pilson. And Sultani refers to Reza Valley as the Bartok of Iran. And I definitely also get something there of the romanticism of Schubert and Schumann blended seamlessly with the scales and melodic inflections of Persian music. And with respect to the performance, I guess I often foreground the piece itself when talking about the stuff I play on this show. It's the piece, it's the composer, and then the performers. But so often it's the particular performance that enhances or even makes the music. And in my defense, I do spend a fair percentage of the research time behind each show in comparing performances and crucially also their recordings in order to pick out the one that I feel best represents the music. In this case, it's just a brilliantly nuanced performance by both players and one which I think really elevates the material. It's taken from Sultani and Pilsen's album called Home, and that was released on Deutsch Grammophon in 2018. And next, it's back to the height of the Tudor period, the 1920s, of course. <laughs> Thank you. 
Henry VIII for the Jazz Age. That's six of the 12 pieces from Lambert's Clavichord by Herbert Howells, written in 1927. All through my life, Howells said, I've had this strange feeling that I belonged somehow to the Tudor period, not only musically, but in every way. And apparently Ralph Vaughan Williams had a theory that he was the reincarnation of one or other of the minor Tudor luminaries. In any case, Howells had certainly had a moment of revelation upon hearing the first performance of Vaughan Williams' Fantasia on a Theme by Thomas Tallis in 1910 at the Three Choirs meeting in Gloucester. It was after then that I felt I really knew myself, both as a man and an artist, he said. It all seemed so incredibly new at the time, but I soon came to realise how very, very old it actually was, how I'd been living that music since long before I could even begin to remember. And the brilliantly idiosyncratic Lambert's clavichord was in effect Howe's riff on Tudor dance pieces via the Fitzwilliam Virginal book, a seminal collection of Elizabethan and early Jacobean keyboard pieces taking its name from the Viscount who bequeathed the manuscript to Cambridge University in the mid-19th century. And there's always something interesting to me in these supposedly minor or more personal pieces by composers predominantly remembered for other pieces. There's an element of light-hearted experimentalism and often personal creative exuberance that can sometimes be missing from large-scale commissions and public-facing works with all their pomp and circumstance. I find the harmonic writing in particular fascinating, both graceful and ingenious. It's partly the pre-functional nature of the source material, so before tonal harmony had become to be codified in the way it was from the time of the late Baroque through to the classical period, blah blah. But then there's the double twist of that in turn being refracted through a neoclassical 20th century sensibility. So there's these intermittently modernist skews on a language that is already mysterious through its historical and circumstantial distance from us. And not to gaslight you too much, but there is no clavichord. That is to say, you are actually listening there to a Lauten work, sometimes called a lute harpsichord. It's a European keyboard instrument of the Baroque period, a little like a harpsichord, but with gut rather than metal strings, and producing a mostly mellow tone. That was performed by John Paul on the Lautenwerk, and taken from the album Howl's Works for Clavichord on the label Centaur in 2002.
that was Heartbeat, written in 2017 by Nilifal Novakesh. And she's an NYC based composer and pianist who grew up in Iran, studying at Tehran University before leaving in 2009 during a turbulent political period for that country and going via Oxford to the States. And there, whilst continuing to write, She's co-founded the Iranian Female Composers Association in 2018, along with Anahita Abazi and Aida Shirazi. And their membership spans North America, Europe and Asia, and includes composers who write for both Western and traditional Persian instruments. And the mission, of course, is to support female composers, especially young women from Iran, through programming, commissioning and mentorship. As you can guess, the situation within Iran for female composers and performers is at best highly uncertain and in practice seemingly all but verboten. Even male composers such as Mehdi Rajabian have faced lengthy jail sentences for working alongside female musicians. And Nilifar Nurbakash has described her own experience growing up learning music in Iran as having had a lot of teachers and musicians telling her she shouldn't compose, generally discouraging her and leading her to stop writing altogether at one point. So she said of the reasons for her setting up the association, there could be someone in Iran right now who might need this, and we should be there for them. And also I found a lot of female composers around the world who are doing amazing work and are active writing music, and I just felt that why are we all so disconnected? That was performed by Nilifar Nurbakash on piano with electronics, and that was released on her YouTube channel in 2017.
some really zippy string writing there. That's the final movement of Ahmad Pejman's Divertimento. He's from La Iran, having grown up studying violin and playing in the Tehran Symphony Orchestra from where he was awarded a scholarship to study composition in Vienna before moving permanently to the US in 1976 prior to the revolution. He's written very widely, both as a classical composer and more commercially, with symphonic works alongside operas, ballets, and also a lot of scores for film and TV under his belt. And there's definitely a bit of a mix of genres going on in that piece. It's got a sprightly directness to it that I really like, and it's played brilliantly, though I know not, I'm afraid, by whom. I can tell you that it was released on the album of the same name though, that's Divertimento, and that the label is Kerad Art House, and the year of release, 2017.
More minimalism from Sweden this month then, though not for once for the organ. That's actually the A-side to this record, if you must ask. You heard there Ellen Arkbro's Chords for Guitar, written last year. She's a young composer, organist and coder who studied at the electronic music studio EMS in Stockholm that I was talking a little bit about in the last show, and also the Royal College of Music. And she's also a student of Lamont Young and Mark Sabat, with whom I believe she studied alternative tuning systems, such as mean tone and temperament. Now, if you're familiar with tuning systems, then you'll already know all about that. If not, well, then basically everything you've been listening to your whole life is based on a lie, or so some would have it. In a nutshell, the dominant system of tuning, known as equal temperament, established in Europe through the 17th and 18th centuries, offers the convenience of workable harmonic modulation to other key centers, but at the cost of compromising certain intervals as compared to their natural Pythagorean ratios. The result, aside from the utility of equal temperament, is not only a different sense of tuning, but one that compromises harmonic or tonal richness via misaligning with the natural overtones or partials of particular intervals. Major thirds are notoriously bad, in ET, and that's one of the things that mean tone temperament aims to address. Anyhow, as far as I know, that piece is tuned in mean tone temperament. Please someone correct me if I'm wrong. And certainly the focus of the piece would seem to be based almost entirely on the resonance of the subtle differences in the decay of each chord and the way that we can focus on the rich overtones within them. And I'd love to know exactly how this piece was recorded. In what sense exactly are we listening to a guitar if it is a conventional guitar, it sounds like it must surely have been mechanically played. It just seems too perfect. Or is it all actually synthesis? The album received some interesting reviews when it came out last year, and this piece in particular seems to divide the crowd a bit. On the one hand, it has a definite procedural severity. None of the developmental niceties we may usually seek are to be found. None of the comforts of melody, rhythm, and so on. But to me at least there is an ambience and an emotional heft to what we have, sitting as it does somewhere between the academic, the industrial, and even the ritualistic or sacred. And Ellen Arkbro has herself drawn connections to sacred music through a method of reduction, stripping away elements in a process she likens to a sculptor chipping away at stone. As she has mysteriously described it, what you pay attention to will change what you hear. As mentioned, the album is Chords, and that was released on the label Subtext last year. Now, if you are hankering for the sunlit uplands of a bit of melody to go along with your chords, well, then how about this? <laughs> 